Welcome to my YouTube channel. My guests on Facing the Canon are Nikki and Scylla Lee, founders of The Parenting Course. Nikki and Scylla Lee, welcome to Facing the Canon. It's wonderful to thank, be here with you, John. Thank you for having us. Oh, delighted. I was reminiscing with Killy this morning. I think we've known you for over 30 years. I, I think, think that's right. Definitely, yeah. 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 I mean, we used to be together at all those amazing focus summer. Yes conferences yeah. what, the, uh, and you, camps or what, yes. what do you call holidays holidays and our children would have played a lot of football oh, together <laughs> we've got three sons you've got three sons we've also right. got a daughter i also got a daughter i know now you two you met at swansea docks is that right very good information yes. we did and you were what how old were you 17 and 16. Uh, i was just 17 by a week yes and i was 18. 18. yeah full head of hair right had my own car very old car but your granny, your granny's car. my granny's old car she and you were to heading to ireland yeah. yeah on holiday so i was going on holiday with a school friend whose family happened to be really good friends with nikki's family and they'd got next door holiday cottages um, and i drew up in the queue to get on the car ferry and Scylla was trying to get the gb stick off the car in front of mine and i sat and i watched her from my mini and we met actually we both fell in love although we didn't know it neither knew that the other felt anything but we were other. with this big group of family and other teenagers and everything and i just thought oh my gosh i absolutely was just like that was it when i saw nikki and, um, and nikki by the time the holiday was over indicated his yes. his i think it was 10 days in wasn't it yeah so well, it, i think it was two days we before revealed I was our feelings for each other yeah so that was good and that was really it from then on we started going out i had still another year to do at school yeah. so but you went to university you kept on dating uh, there's um, an interesting story where you both in order to kind of discern whether you should get married you decided to have a kind of don't see each other for a couple of months yeah tell us about that well both of us had come to faith uh six months into uh time your university, university Scylla yeah. was down in london at i was up at cambridge she'd come up pretty well every weekend and well in fact every weekend <laughs> there was an exception and it was uh i suppose it was about six months after we came to faith where we both thought independently we need to know whether god wants us to be together and we hated the idea that we might not be but we just felt this is the one part of our lives that we haven't really surrendered and the only way we'll know is if we decide to spend three months apart so we had this agreement we wouldn't talk to each other on the phone. We actually continued writing letters to mm. each other, but we wouldn't see each other, wouldn't communicate with each other. In and any Nikki other wouldn't way. come to London, and I wouldn't go to Cambridge. However, a week later, you're both in Kensington. Yeah, it was well, <laughs> tell by us, accident, tell completely us. by accident. What John. happened? I, I was uh, I was going to play football at my old school. Went with two old school friends, and to my horror, on the way back, this friend said, "I need to go back." via London and I thought oh no I don't want to be in London but he said I've just got to drop something off at home I'll leave you on High Street Cairn I'll pick you up in this spot in 20 minutes time so there I was standing on the pavement in High Street Cairn it was raining and we were going to get a McDonald's or, or something and in the meantime I was I mean miserable I'd been crying for four days and I was on a bus the 49 bus going I can remember it, going to High Street Ken. I was going to a meeting off High Street Ken and it was pouring with rain and we were stuck in this traffic and I just felt, I mean, it must have been God, just saying, get off the bus now and walk. And I got off the bus, turned and right. I looked up and there was Scylla walking towards me about 50 yards away, coming down the pavement. And we just looked at each other and I just screamed. I, I abandoned my friends, ran <laughs> just swung her round and round on the pavement oh i mean it was just amazing and we thought whoa if if god can orchestrate a meeting when we had determined not to be 
uh, together and we were in a city of however many million people London is mm -hmm. that he we should meet like that we thought yeah I think maybe this he is, can show us he, he can, can show, show us, us. <laughs> and so of course, we did spend that three months apart and you did that. get married and we did yes. get married and you've yes. been married for how long 44 and a half years oh. yeah. now to our viewers Nikki and Silla Lee are the founders of the marriage course and in part two of Facing the Canon, we're going to be talking about marriage and the marriage course and learning principles that will encourage and enrich and enhance uh, our marriages. Um, so I hope you'll join us for part two. But in this programme, we want to hear more about your faith and then we're going to talk about parenting. Mm. So how did you two come to faith? Well, uh Neither of us had grown up in church-going families. Uh, having no, said that, Silla's uh, father was a, he, was he was very, a very traditional, faithful. faithful church. Well, he was in the Episcopal Church yes. in, in Scotland. But as, as families, my family would go to church on Christmas Day, always, absolutely regularly, and sometimes on Easter Day. But, but apart from that, we weren't a church-going family. When I arrived at university, I met a Christian who I got to know and really liked, and he started talking to me about a personal relationship with Jesus. And I thought, that's the strangest idea. I've never heard that in my life. But it slightly intrigued me. And I started going to talks and exploring it and having conversations with this guy and then other Christians that I met. And it was the second term at university. There was a mission over 10 days. The speaker, David McInnes, coming to oh. do a talk each night. Yes. And I went on the first, I was taken by this friend and on the first night. There were about, oh, no, about a thousand people there. I, we sat right at the back. He, David McKinnis was tiny. <laughs> but I'd never heard anyone speaking with such power and authority. And I felt myself being drawn and threatened all at the same time. Yes. Drawn as he talked about Jesus, the love of Jesus, what life as a Christian is about, but very threatened because I knew that it meant surrendering everything. And that included my relationship with Scylla. And she knew nothing of what I was exploring. I hadn't told her at all. So actually during that week, I was in London and Nikki actually came to London and uh, we went to this little um, bistro for, for dinner. And I remember him sitting across the table and explaining to me about this whole thing of faith and discovering about Jesus and a personal relationship. And he said, I, I, I just sort of want to say, I think I need to respond and become a Christian. I wasn't very good at explaining it because I wasn't and, a Christian myself <laughs> yet. I and really I just it. apparently, I mean, I don't really remember this, but apparently I looked around and just said, oh, that sounds wonderful. My and heart sank, I thought. She doesn't she understand. She doesn't understand at all. <laughs> no. We've got to surrender everything, our relationship, everything to God. So anyway, thankfully I was going to, to Cambridge that weekend and I um, got off the train on Friday and Nikki came and met me and dragged me straight to hear this same man, David McInnes. And again, we were at sort of the very back of a thousand people. But again, I literally was gripped by what he was saying. And really what had happened for Nikki in the space of six months of exploring and discovering happened for me in about 24 so, so hours. So it's always been quicker than me. Oh, wow. <laughs> and it was, yeah, it was when David talked very specifically uh, the following night about the cross mm. and why Jesus had died. And I suddenly, it was like, I need forgiveness. Yes. I actually haven't got my life sorted out, which I thought I had at that stage, you know, that the world was my oyster, I could do anything, I was in love, I was, you know, it was like everything was fine, I could control my life. And suddenly it was like, oh gosh, and he's gone to the cross for me, me personally. And, and he said, if anybody would like to start a relationship with Jesus, you can do that tonight. And he um, invited us to go and, and pray. I, at the same time, at this same talk, was thinking, I think that's true, that Jesus died for me. And if I do nothing about it, he's died in vain. That thought just hit me. And we went forward together. Both and of you did. Yeah. Knelt and knelt down side at by the front side. of this and David church. David led us, and there were, I don't know, 40 or 50 people, all prayed a prayer of commitment to Jesus. And something shifted, something oh. changed. Oh, very big. Straight away. Well, I, it was a, a great moment of praying, but as we walked away from the church, this friend, Christian friend, 
I, I said to him, that was an amazing evening. And he said to me, is it yes or no then? And I thought, oh gosh, it's one thing to pray a prayer. It's another to say to him what I felt. And it felt like an age. It was probably, I don't know, 30 seconds that I paused. And then I said, it's yes. And the moment I said that to him, it's yes, I had this revelation. It's like my life was, all the different parts of my life were made up of different parts yes. of a jigsaw puzzle. And they all went thump in place. And everything, I just felt suddenly, everything makes sense. And that was a very key moment. For and me. that remind, it reminds me of that scripture, Nikki. Um, if we believe in our heart yes. and confess with our lips. Yes. And so the moment you confess with your lips. Yes, exactly that. Yeah. Exactly that. And, wow. And, and I think the difference that I felt was that the next day I was in the library, I was, I was reading English, um, doing English literature, and I was, and there was, David McInnes was doing one more talk to the rowing club of St John's College. It wasn't my college, it was next door, but somebody had invited me to go and join the rowing club. And I couldn't wait to hear David speak about Jesus again. And halfway through the morning, I thought, gosh, that's extraordinary. I, I'd never felt that before about, I'm not sure about anything in my life. I wanted to know Jesus more. And that, again, just helped to convince me something's happened. Amazing. And then following, following university, uh, uh, tell, I know you lived in Japan. What were yes. you doing in Japan? Well, we got married literally two weeks after Nikki graduated. I was still a student um, at art college. Nikki actually became a student for another year. So we were students. So we got married, 21, 22. And, um, and then we just felt that it would be very good, having got married so young, to go and live and work abroad and get a very different perspective on life. And we were very, you know, we were around a community of people who knew us really well and, and all of that. And we thought we would go somewhere, you know, like Africa or we had rather South America, notions of being that missionary we would be somewhere. missionary, you know. Actually, we ended up in Japan, which was so clearly God, and into a culture and a country literally the other side of the globe. You can't even see it from here on the map. Um, that we knew nothing about. We couldn't speak the language. It was an absolutely different culture. They don't even eat with knives and forks and they sleep on the, on the floor. And we lived in Japan for three years and we had the most remarkable, remarkable time. And um, we came to love yeah. the people, yes. love the country. Love we the food. Love the food. Eat yes. with chopsticks, sleep on the floor. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, and we saw how very small the church was. Yes. And while in Korea, you know, just across the water, church had exploded and was a revival that hadn't happened in Japan. Yes. And yet we saw how relevant the gospel was there in a completely different culture to our own. And before we left, we did see some of our yeah. closest Japanese friends becoming Christians. And that was the deepest joy for us. There's a, there's a lovely story. Uh, I gather there was the apple season in Japan and you had <laughs> loads of apples. Oh. And um, uh, Nikki wanted to go away to a friend for a weekend and you didn't want to go. Well, we had just had the... Um, new advent of a, a child in our As relationship. Well, so you had a baby, so then you decided to start throwing the apples at Nikki. So tell us, tell us that story. Oh, God. Well, well I, I, th this friend had invited us. Uh, he was a bachelor, lived in Tokyo. We'd been to stay with him several times before we had a child. And, and he was social gregarious and loads of parties. Parties non-stop. Breakfast, so did... coffee, lunch, tea, dinner, out. You know. And it was the Wednesday before we were due to go for the weekend. Scylla said, I don't think I can cope. I, I'm too... She was exhausted. I felt we had to go because he would have arranged all these parties around us being there. So I clearly was not he quite had understanding how tired Scylla was. Missing, misunderstood and misinterpreted. And she lost it with me. Completely lost it. And I just happened to be standing by this basket of apples. And there were a lot of there them, were a lot of as them you said. Arranged in a pyramid. And I just saw red and started throwing these across the room. He yes. luckily was behind the sofa. Well, I ducked down behind the sofa. 
and I waited until the basket was empty before I re-emerged. Got rid of my aggression. Then, and, um, yeah. and then you talked it through. Yeah, well, but we still didn't agree. And then and we, we prayed that night. Yeah. We prayed that evening before we went to bed. Said, Lord, what do we do? And you know, into my mind, as we were praying, I thought, I'm more concerned about the embarrassment with our friend yes. than I am about the welfare of Scylla. Yes. And I thought, I need to say, I'm sorry, my darling. I haven't understood. I haven't yes. taken enough account. I'll ring our friend and say we can't come. No. The moment I said that, Scylla said, oh, well, if you understand how tired I am, I'm sure I'll be able to cope. <laughs> so we went. <laughs> Understanding was yes. very important. Yeah. Very, very key. When he expressed some empathy, yeah, absolutely. You, you responded. Yeah, yeah. With... exactly. So uh, then you went on and, and um, got ordained in the Church of England, Nikki. It was, we, I did, although it was a question, do we stay in Japan because we saw the need, we longed to see more people becoming Christians there, or do we come back to the UK? In the end, having talked to various people, including David McInnes, yes. we felt the greater opportunities for talking to people about Jesus are here, where we can talk in our own language. And partially, we weren't fluent yeah, because we were not fluent in sure. Japanese, and we were 30 by that stage. And apparently learning a language fluently after 30 is quite a challenge. Absolutely. But you went, eventually went to Durham, yep. you studied theology, and you ended up as a, a, a curate, which is an assistant minister, yes. uh, Holy Trinity Brompton, yes. and then subsequently associate vicar. 1985, I arrived as a, as a curate, and I remember the vicar at the time saying, Nick, I hope you'll stay a long time. <laughs> I don't think he was thinking of 36 no. years when he said that, but we've been there ever since. And uh, it, it, it's a thriving, for those that don't know, um, Holy, Holy Trinity is a thriving, flourishing church. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I've had the privilege over um, several decades of both fellowship, friendship and ministry uh, at HDB and I have to say uh, it is a church that thinks globally and also acts locally um, and that is just so encouraging and, and out of the church have come so many things. Now one of the books that you guys have put together is the parenting book and you also run um, a course, the parenting course. Okay tell us first of all what prompted you to do that? Mm. We have, we well, have we four have. children <laughs> uh, and w we were getting, a, I think partially because we got married a little bit younger than most of our friends and contemporaries and then started to have children a little bit sooner, some of our friends and contemporaries. We were getting a lot of questions. I, what, what do we do? How, how do we build a, a family life? What, what, does, what does it look like? And some, of course, hadn't had the advantage. We we've had which is of coming from close loving families so we were taking what we've we've learned the legacy from our own parents what we've learned uh, from having children ourselves building a family life and from what we understood as lies at the heart of the christian gospel what it means to show unconditional love to to our children we so we we started running uh, actually, two courses. Initially, it was the Parenting Children course yes. for, for parents of children 0 to 10, and then Parenting Teenagers, which we started from 11 to 18. I think by the... I, I've got three sons, uh, one daughter-in-law, three grandchildren. I think by the time you get the hang of parenting, your children <laughs> have left home. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, what, uh, what I love about your book, um, also with incredible illustrations from our mutual friend, yes, Charlie so Mackesy. Yeah. Um, I, I, I liked very much near the introduction, actually, uh, where you, you confess that you haven't g always got it right. And um, you actually asked your children <laughs> to <laughs> each write down incidents that they could remember. Well, where just you... one incident, because we knew there'd be a, an awful lot more. more. <laughs> So we said one. <laughs> one. And what I find so lovely is that you actually included them in the book. And, and we don't always get it right, do we? No. Uh, Gosh, but but no. you look back at hindsight and, you know, what do we do with regrets? 
you know, we all have regrets mm. when it comes to parenting. Mm. And you, you, you know, what do you do with those regrets? I, I would say, because I got it wrong many, many, many times. And I think what you can, I would want to say to people is, you can start from where you are now. And that actually, I mean, that applies whether your kids are five and under or 10 and over or 25 and over because we're all in relationship with our kids, whether they're adult kids now or, you know, they're, you're parenting them now. And we can all start where we are now. And I'll just give you an example from, from our family. So, so um, we have our daughter, Kirsty, and then three boys and our middle boy, Barney, um, when he got to be about 14, 13, 14, he and I are very similar, yeah. quite strong characters, clashed quite a lot. But actually our relationship was not in very good shape. And one day he said to me, came in from school and he just said, I must have said something to him. And he said, mum, you're always so stressed with me. And I, gosh, and I thought, wow, perhaps I am. And he then described that I was on his back, that my voice was always stressed. I was always going higher and higher, asking him questions, you know, pro, pro, pro. And actually it really brought me up short and I, then had a very good conversation with him and and I said to him okay I'm gonna I didn't even realize I was doing this and I'm gonna give you permission to tell me when I'm sounding stressed and see if I can bring some change and you know that really started a new thing and I had to change it wasn't his problem it was my problem and it really helped and there were times when I still got it wrong and um, he had to say mum you're sounding stressed and it but it totally changed our relationship. Yes. And uh, I can say we are really good now. You're good now. But you're, you're hinting there, uh, Scylla, on the word listening, aren't you? Like, we want our children to listen to us, uh, but we obviously have to Need listen to, to them yeah. as well, yeah. don't we? Yes, absolutely. And I think what we've heard a lot from families is how they've needed to listen to their children. What are their children? feeling, experiencing, and so on, as well as, you know, with partners, listening to each other, because we all process anxiety, stress, struggle, challenges in different ways. And we can't assume either our partner or our children are processing and feeling the same thing. For me personally, and I know other parents may not feel like this, but some do, that worrying about our kids brought out the worst in me. Yes. And that was probably why I was stressed with Barney, because I was worried about where he was, what he was doing, who he was with, what he was thinking about doing, you know, because I knew he was like me. He was going to do all sorts sure. of things that I... And, and you were magnifying I it. I was. And so I was stressed and worried and anxious uh, a lot more than Nicky was. And, um, and actually looking back now, I would say if I had my time, time again I would pray more and worry less because the praying of course helps you to really get inside their skin as you're praying Absolutely. for a child and thinking about what what are they going through and I think I didn't do that enough and um, got stressed instead. Yes it's interesting that the uh, two of the most unlikely people in the Bible lost Jesus his mother and his stepfather. Mm. Scripture says that he went back with his mother and stepfather and he grew in favour with God uh, and in favour with people. What tips would you give um, to parents to encourage their children to grow in favour with God and with people? I think, you know, the... Uh the, the home environment within which our children grow up, as, as we've said, we, we won't get everything right. No parent can do that. But there are things that we can do to seek to create a home environment that is, that is nurturing. And in the home, the thing that makes a home a loving home is not the furniture, it's not the number of toys, it's not the holidays, it's the relationships. And it's the adult relationships, if we're parenting as a couple, it's the relationship between us. Are we able to 
uh, communicate? Are we able to resolve our conflicts, forgive each Say other? Say sorry, Say so forgive each other. And relationships yeah. with our children. At the end of the day, this is what is most important. We believe that showing them love. You know, everybody needs encouragement and our children need <laughs> encouragement. Yeah. Most of the time we think they need correcting or advice <laughs> how to do this or that. But actually, more than anything, I think they just need encouraging, well done, praising for what they've done well. Not, not, not sort of praise for something they've done terribly, but there'll always be something we can find that they've done well. And I think another thing is, is feeling safe. Yes. And a, a home environment that feels safe is not a place that's perfect. It's a place actually where you fail, but when you fail, there's forgiveness, and restoration and it's okay and that of course when they see that between parents or other adults that gives a great sense of security it's okay we can get it wrong we can mess up but actually we can make a new start and we can say sorry and be forgiven and um, and th that builds trust that is so and, and I think the safe place is a place where you can trust and, and that's why consistency and, um, and building that place of, you know, it's okay to fail, but we can start again and we still love you. And love is unconditional. Absolutely. Well, there's lots of advice and lots of tips in this book. Um, uh, as I was reading through it yesterday, I, I thought, oh, uh, if, if I was giving you a little commendation, I was thinking I'd give you this commendation. Uh, how to raise children without raising your blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's great. But the, um, the course, is that available for anybody? Tell us about the parenting course. Well, the parenting course is on DVD. So w what typically happens is uh, people gather a group of parents together they get the DVD, they watch, the, uh, they watch the, the film, and then they discuss it as parents together. And actually, that discussion that they have with other parents, they find, oh my goodness, we're not the only ones yes. who feel this. And they pick up tips from each other. We, we, we raise the subject, really. We sort of set the topics, we give some ideas. Mm, great. But it, it's what they gain from each other as parents that is so valuable. And, and, and it's age related, so parenting younger children, that's the parenting course, and parenting teenagers, parenting older ones. Brilliant. Nikki, Silili, thank you for joining us on Facing the Canon. Thank you for thank having you us. Thank you for having us very much. Oh, well, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope it inspired you. Uh, do, do look at these resources and please join us again next week. We'll have Nikki and Silla Lee back and we'll talk about marriage and the marriage course. Thank you for joining us on Facing the Canon. <laughs>